welcome back to another episode of the Millennium Live podcast series. I'm Connor Tui. I'm very excited to talk to Jerry Plaza today. He is the field CTO in the Chief Strategy Office at Netscope, which is a very great company that is helping you stay ahead of cloud, data, and network security challenges. And we got a great group of questions, which we're going to dive right in. But Jerry, thanks so much for joining the Millennium Live podcast today. Connor, I am uh, excited and happy to be here um, and uh, looking forward to our conversation and, and, and helping our listeners really understand what we're doing in the cybersecurity space and how they can best be protecting their companies, their users, and their data. I love that plan. So let's jump into it. So you got a great, uh, impressive background in uh, in technology, and you know you spent time at 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 and T and Mastercard, at Dell, and n- now you're at Netscope. So I just want to kick off this uh, podcast by kind of getting in more of a background on you. You know, could you just tell our audience a little bit about your yourself and maybe your journey as a CTO? Absolutely. You know, um, it the, the journey started just very early on with a focus and uh, and a curiosity in myself of how technology worked. Um, you know, coming out of school, immediately going into an IT role I, uh, within the in, in, uh, industry of telecommunications at that time with AT and T. But at, you know, you think AT and T, you think telco and what does that necessarily mean from an IT perspective outside of circuits, phones, wireless, mobile, et cetera. But it, you got to look at the underlying services that businesses drive and it's technology that drives business. Um, and so stepping into technology in that space kind of started with where, where a lot of I, IT individuals uh, that have ideas of grander start with is just a help desk, right? Yeah. Being there and being a support desk and helping, you know, local users with their PCs and, and the troubles and issues they have with their PCs. Um, but always having, again, that curiosity of there's more out there in, in IT and I want to be not just at the help desk, but I want to be on the network. I want to be on the back end where all of our servers and applications lives and just kind of evolving my my skill sets um, and the value that I drove to companies to step into a data center. Uh, and then moving into an administrator of infrastructure uh, and continuously evolving to literally every aspect that makes up infrastructure and operations. Um, if there's a role out there in, in INO organizations, I've either individually done the role myself and or led teams or teams of teams uh, as I've progressed through my career of anything that makes up ultimately what, what is enterprise architecture and how the applications live and how they're interconnected from end user all the way back into the data. Um, and so there's been a, a very good trajectory um, across all aspects of IT, which ultimately leads into security. Uh, as you can understand, right, early on, IT was all about just enabling connections, user to data. We didn't ho- have a whole lot of concern outside of physical security of what needed to be protected. But as threat actors came about, um, attack surfaces, and just the ch- changing nature of complexity in the, in, in the infrastructure, it became more and more prevalent that you need to have very, very keen security controls in place so that you can protect um, not just the data, but the brand and the, uh, the intellectual property of, of a company. Uh, and so it's kind of a natural progression of moving through IT and then landing where I'm at today in, in the cybersecurity space, which is really been um, front and center across right every aspect of our businesses and every industry across every vertical from governments all the way down to uh, the small mom and pop shops that uh, need to protect the way they do business and their ability to do business. So um, it, it's been a, a very long trajectory, but um, something that has just progressed me up into the position where I'm at today. That's terrific. And thanks for taking us through that journey, uh, Jerry. It's a very impressive, as I as I mentioned earlier. So excited to continue this conversation. And um, you know, I, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes. I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes in technology over the years and security. And uh, I know that Netscope understands uh, a, a way to pr- protect users, protect organizations, and protect data. You know, coming from the CTO background, what what's really your take on security? as a team sport and 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 do you feel that this is an important way that you know companies and enterprises should be approaching security 
Absolutely. You know, every aspect of IT, uh, and I'll use IT as the foundation that kind of sits underneath a business and sits underneath cybersecurity as a whole. Every aspect of IT is a team sport. Um, everyone has a role, right? There is a network administrator. There is a server administrator. Um, there is a help desk, right? There is a uh, an individual that manages and supports the operating system from Windows to Linux and everything in between. So everyone kind of has a unique aspect of a particular role, just like a team does, right? You've got quarterbacks, you've got receivers, you've got running backs, you've got offense, you've got defense. To be successful, your team needs to be working as a single cohesive unit towards the overall goal. What is the goal uh, of the team, right? It's score touchdown. Absolutely. So we're all working together to do that. Well, in IT, overall goals are drive the business objectives, right? Deliver the services that our business is, is differentiated in the marketplace with. Well, in security, the goal is to protect the intellectual property, protect the brand, protect the ability for our business to continue functioning and delivering the service uh, in without impacting um, the, the connectivity, without impacting uh, the access to very critical, you know, personal information that uh, our consumers and our customers are entrusting us with. And so the, the team sport aspect becomes extremely important uh, because you need to work together to avoid pitfalls of cyber vulnerabilities and attacks. These attacks come from us from different angles. They come from us from different vectors. They come from us in, in different methods uh, that could Vulner that, that could make my business vulnerable, right? And I think of it as the team sport, even beyond just IT, but just regular users. You and I, Connor, we're sitting here and I'm on an email, and all it takes is one little mistake for me as a person in accounting, for instance, to click on that link that says, Hey, your password's locked. Click here to uh, unlock your password. And all of a sudden, I've given a threat actor access to my identity on the business network, which they can then be used to, uh, to impact the overall um, business aspects of, of delivering services. And so the, the team sport aspect goes way beyond IT. It goes to every single individual in a company. We all have to work together because we're only as strong as that weakest link. And we can have the best tools, the best technology, the best policies. Uh, but if I have one slip of an individual that just so happened to click on that link, uh, it, it, it puts the business at risk. Uh, and that's what makes cybersecurity such an important foundation for every business. Uh, and, and there are multiple security frame, cybersecurity frameworks that organizations follow. Uh, and everyone needs unique skills, unique capabilities. And that's why we all together, right, IT, security, and even just everybody in the business all need to work together to be good digital citizens uh, at the end of the day to protect uh, our, our company and our ability to conduct business. Well said, Jerry. I I, I agree totally. Uh, security is a team sport, and uh, while uh, you know the security leaders in the organization may be the pitchers and and the closer, well, we still need our fielders out there. So yeah. everybody does play a role. And I, I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, and talk about this working cross function uh, functionality. You know, you know how have you seen the role of security? evolve, you know, across IT, pharmaceuticals, um, healthcare organizations at large? The, the evolution has, has definitely expanded to the nature of the complexity of our infrastructure. Um, in the early days, uh, and I, I say early days as, as if I'm super old, but not, I'm not overly too old, <laughs> uh, but early on, let's say early 2000s, um, and maybe even early, late 90s, we had a very simple concept. All my infrastructure sat in one data center, uh, and that data center was protected by four walls. And all I had to do was really protect the physical access into that environment. Everything lived inside of my perimeter. And that's the castle as the mentality, right? I had a castle. Everything inside my castle, as long as I built a moat around my castle, I could protect it. And so it was a, a lot less complex. Pre prevent anybody coming in to the castle using a moat, and I'm, I, I've got this concept that I'm secure. But then, right, new bridges started getting built, and we had people that wanted to live outside the castle, uh, and so they would venture out, and well, they still needed to get access inside to the castle, so we had to create even yet more capabilities for them to get access through 
you know, side doors and back doors to get access to do their business. And all of a sudden, it became a lot more complex for me to protect uh, my critical assets as now there's all kinds of entry points. When before there was just one drawbridge, I had one ent ent entry and one exit, I could protect that really easy. But now I have 50 entrance and exits. It became a lot more complex. Um, and so we had to kind of create new concepts, new capabilities and implement new hardware defenses. Um, and then we got the proliferation of the internet and all of a sudden malware and malicious intent started coming in from these network connections that we had created that we were using for business. And yet I needed more capabilities. And so we had this idea of, um, of infrastructure and security sprawl uh, and tech, let's just call it technology sprawl. I used a best in class product as every new gap was exposed. Oh, we evolved to use the internet for our business. I need to go figure out a new tool for that. And oh, we now have users that are using laptops uh, and they're leaving the, the office. I got, I need new technologies for that. And we just kept bolting on and bolting on and everything was independent and it became extremely complex. The, the evolution has all kind of led us into that nature of what do we do to now bring that back in and look at it as a platform which is what security should be done. And you, you need to start looking at it as a platform and an ecosystem because every single piece of that ecosystem has an indicator, it has alerts, it has events, and we need it all speaking together so that we can be the most secure in the most proactive way possible. So in your time as a CTO, how are you able to work cross-functionally with your organization to, to help reduce friction? The most ideal way, obviously, is to is to get the buy-in, right? You, you've got to ensure that everybody understands why are we doing what we're doing. It's not because I want to make your job hard. I'm not trying to prevent you from doing your job. I'm not putting these security controls because I want to watch you like Big Brother, right? And that was early days. A lot of people were like afraid, oh, there's a web proxy. They're just trying to watch what internet websites I'm going to. That wasn't the intent of the web proxy. The intent was to protect access and legal situations that could come about as far as accessing certain websites. Um, and so it's about educating your user base, constantly making sure you're communicating and being open and transparent. Here's why we're doing this. And here's the value and here's the, the value to the business. And here's why you should care. And when you can have those open conversations with, with your user base, your employees, um, and you, you ultimately start to get the buy-in. Oh, I understand. Right. You're not putting this in place because you just want to make sure I'm doing my job or you, you want to watch me like Big Brother. You're doing this because you're trying to protect the data. And if we impact our brand, our ability to do business, that impacts my job. And so it's about getting that buy in and, and working cross functionally is extremely important uh, in the sense of the, going back to the team sport aspect, because it, one week link can, can bring the whole team down. Working together and finding the skills in the different roles that are out there across the different organizations ultimately allows us to put the best pieces in place like a chessboard, right? I'm, I know I've got a king, I've got a rook, I've got a knight. I'm going to put them on the board where they best will help us defend and protect our company, our intellectual property, our data. And that cross team function is so important to do to be able to deliver that because we all have unique skills, capabilities, uh, and abilities to help support the business. And all together, we, we become a stronger team. Well said. And to really kind of put a bow on this uh, this team effort here, this is, a, this is a topic that's always usually discussed at you know any assembly summit. But I, I'm curious in, to hear your opinion on it and maybe a, your take. But how can security leaders effectively communicate with board members, with the rest of the C-suite, about security and the importance of security and why everybody should be involved in it. Extremely critical, right? Going back to what I was just referencing in regards to the buy-in, right? The buy-in starts at the very top. Uh, if we're not being driven uh, with the company's objectives, you, you don't have the, the North Star, if you will, of, from a corporation or from a business to ensure that we're doing the right things, like we're investing in the right things and we're uh, putting priorities on the right projects to ensure we're being the most secure, uh, effective company we can. 
Um, but if you want to make sure you're right, we're, we're, our leaders are effectively communicating in regards to that. Uh, it's about using very clear and concise language, right? Board members, off, more often than not, are not very technical. Uh, they're not going to be technically backgrounded and they're not going to be experts in security jargon. So it's important for security leaders to communicate in very clear and simple terms, right? And avoid technical language and explain security risks and mitigation strategies in a way that is easy for non-technical board members to understand. And when you can do that in an effective manner, um, you're, you're more apt to get the buy-in that you need to ensure that they're putting the objectives, the direction, the budget uh, that is necessary to be effective. Uh, secure leaders, you know, continue down that path. Secure leaders should provide the board with relevant, up-to-date information on security threats, vulnerabilities, trends, and be very open and honest with gaps. As long, if I can communicate where the threats are coming from, where our vulnerabilities are, and where my gaps are, I can ensure that I I'm going to get the focus, the budget, and the priority to to plug those holes and close those gaps. Uh, and so that will allow security teams to really kind of drive the technology that they need to defend the business with support of the board. And again, getting that buy-in because at the end of the day, it's all about putting focus on the business impact as a leader in security. When you're talking to that board, you need to communicate with the board, the leaders of, of the business uh, and, and focus that communication on what does it mean to the business? What is the business impact of security risks and incidents? Uh, and this means highlighting the potential financial reputation, reputational impact to the brand, legal consequences of a security beach, breach, and, and how these risks can be mitigated. And that is something that the board will really resonate with and understand uh, at the end of the day is what is the impact to the business uh, by the security threats, vulnerabilities, uh, and the risk management that we have in place. So that becomes extremely important for any leader uh, in a company to effectively communicate the uh, the potentials of and the necessity of security uh, to the board of directors. So in terms of teaming up on security, you know, you know this cloud transformation and this working remotely, you know, they, that's it's changed how security needs to work. So you know, the last couple of years, global pandemic, it's really kind of meant an acceleration uh, to move to the cloud. Did, you, did your team use this as an opportunity to transform security? Uh, and and if so, how? You know, I, 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 without a doubt, uh, the pandemic accelerated a, a lot of digital transformation. Uh, and what I mean by digital transformation is uh, the um, rationalization of how companies deliver their business and their services back to their customers. This mentality that, I need to buy hardware, procure it, wait six, you know, three to six months for it to show up on my data center floor, and then spend another six months building it, uh, configuring it, getting it all set up. So it's, it takes me a year to deliver infrastructure just so my developers can start putting their applications and delivering services back to customers. That, that it just was too slow. And that's why cloud uh, and hyperscalers became extremely prolific and, and very popular in the industry pre-COVID is companies were looking at ways to deliver their services at a much more ex ex expedited rate back to their business, back to their customers. COVID then came about and just absolutely put the, the, the burner afterburners on that. And every company, if you needed to be, if you wanted to continue as a business, you had to find a way to deliver your services digitally, right? Imagine I used to go to a restaurant and just sit down and order based off of a paper menu, right? And get my food. Well, when COVID hit, I couldn't go to the restaurant. So unless that, that restaurant found a way to digitally allow me to digitally order food and, and find some way to deliver it to me or give me at least a curbside pickup capability that they couldn't, they, they can no longer conduct business. And so it accelerated the fashion. What happened though, is because everybody put such a tremendous amount of focus on digital transformation, security became a laggard. All we all found super creative, unique, new ways to deliver services and, and deliver our business capabilities out to consumers, out to customers. And then security became an afterthought. And what's happening now is kind of a global reset of the security mindset. Oh, shoot. 
I now have data everywhere. I've got data in the cloud. I've got data in different locations. I've got data in remote offices. I got users accessing my data from all kinds of different locations. I got to protect this. And so that's now all of a sudden, I would say the, the pandemic accelerated digital transformation at, at to just an, the, an absolute uh, r ridiculous amount of speed and, and velocity. But now that we're coming off of COVID, companies are now resetting the, their security because now they're seeing the, the proliferation, the, the distribution of their data and their users have now gone everywhere. They got to find new ways to secure it. And so uh, the aftermath of the pandemic is what I would say um, has forced us to finding new effective ways to deliver security capabilities uh, under this new norm of hybrid work remote workforce applications no longer living inside of data centers uh, and users accessing data from, you know, any which location they feel like they want to work from. I want to talk a little bit about Netscope and, and the great work that you're doing over there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, helping your customers, reducing risk, you know, accelerating that performance and gaining visibility. I'm, I'm curious, you know, what is one way that you're currently working to promote this, better digital citizenship over at Netscope? Uh, I, I really love the word digital citizenship because uh, at the end of the day, as we've been kind of talking throughout this this podcast, it's it's about the, the team sport aspect of uh, of every single individual at a company. And we all have to really be good stewards of our of our business and of our data and of our access and what we're doing from a act, activity perspective. What we're delivering at Netscope and how we're helping companies really kind of drive the acceleration of, of security transformation is to follow suit of how businesses transform their ability to deliver applications, right? Applications were, are now being delivered as a service. Uh, they're consuming it from, uh, if the first place a business looks at if they're going to look, if they need an application is, can I buy it? Can I go off to the shelf and go buy an HR system or EMR, right? A, a medical record system um, or an email platform. Well, I don't want to manage my Outlook. I'll just use Office 365, for instance. And so they go to SaaS and then they say, well, okay, let me build an application because I need something specific. Well, I'm going to build it in the hyperscalers because I can deliver it much faster than having to wait for my IT team to build infrastructure on-prem. So they're, they're utilizing the cloud in all these new ways that helps them accelerate their ability to do business. Well, we need to think of security in the same way. Why should I be building hardware-centric uh, stacks of infrastructure that sits in a data center or sits on-prem in my facility when none of my traffic, or let's say, I don't want to say none, but a very, very little of my traffic now traverses through. Our, our traffic's no longer going through data centers. It's going to the internet. And the internet has now really kind of become the corporate backbone, right? When I go to email, I don't go to a data center to get my email. It, what they're doing is they just spend, spit me back out to Office 365, Microsoft Azure. I go to Workday for my HR system. I don't go into my, my data center to get that application. I go straight to Workday. We're on Zoom. You and I are right now on Zoom. I don't go to my data center because Zoom doesn't live in my data center. Zoom lives up in an as-a-service cloud consumption model. So everything's out there on the internet. The only way I can protect my data, my access, my users is to put it where all the traffic is. And the traffic is out on the internet. So why are we not thinking of security in that way? Why are we not thinking about delivering security as a service, cloud consumption, agile, scaled infinitely based on my business needs in the, the exact place where all my traffic is, which is out on the internet. And so Netscope created uh, the, literally the, the, the best in class distributed global infrastructure security cloud that is in close proximity to every user anywhere in the world and, and provides a very low latency, high performance, full inline protection stack of security controls through a single policy. And now all of a sudden that allows businesses to implement security controls at a much a, a more rapid pace, much more consistently, uh, and with much more visibility and control than they have been able to in the past. And we can do it extremely rapidly because I don't have to build stacks of hardware and figure out how to configure it. I literally just subscribe to a licensed as a service model. 
I steer my traffic to it and all of a sudden I'm being secure. And that's what's driving uh, the future generation of security for companies. And we just happen to be in the very best place for delivering that service to customers as they evolve into this, into this new direction. Mm. And that's actually a perfect segue into kind of this last segment, this last part of the podcast. I always like to sort of end the podcast and talking about the future and goals and um, so I have just a couple more questions for you, Jerry. And sure. um, this is a you know two couple of hot topics uh, discussing in, in security leadership today. But um, one is one is talent and gaining that talent and recruiting that talent. Specifically, how do we get more diversity in security leadership roles, and how do we better recruit in in cybersecurity? Great question. You know, I, I think the the new nature of uh, a business is all about enabling the best user experience. Um, and when we, when it comes to recruiting, it's about ensuring that you find the right resource to fit the puzzle piece that you're looking to fit, right? And we've been talking about this as a as a team sport, right? I I, need, I have a team. I need to go find a really good wide receiver because I'm a little bit weak there in that area. Well, what we want to do is ensure that we're opening the uh, the ability to recruit and find the right resources wherever that resource happens to be. So I'm no longer just looking for a resource that is just in St. Louis, which is where I happen to live, uh, or in Silicon Valley, up where a lot of the uh, IT companies and startups happen to be. I'm opened up to the global aspect of the talent that is out there across the world, because we now have an ability to literally work from anywhere um, and, and secure that access from anywhere, going anywhere. And so we want to look at diverse mentality of how other people in other parts of the world think about business and think about protecting and think about new creative ways to do that, right? When we only concentrate on talent pools that are just happen to be in a very small ge geographical location, eh, those, those individuals tend to all kind of think somewhat similar. Um, but when we open it up to the, the vast diversity of the world, uh, and I can now start to get different cultures, different aspects of, of innovation, different ideas that are, are created to help move my business forward, I can start to drive far more diversity into my business. Uh, and, and, and then it starts with uh, a, a grassroots effort uh, at the elementary schools right at the at the young age of ensuring and creating excitement of what what does a job look like in cybersecurity what kind of things could you be doing uh that could help protect the data and and literally the connections and access and applications that the that makes the world move and the way it makes the world go go around and you've got to really kind of start with that grassroots effort at at young ages so that individuals understand what is possible in a cybersecurity role and why should you want to go into a cybersecurity role so that we're not always just getting the same type of talent pool uh, that are coming up through the ranks and stepping out into the workforce uh, for us to recruit from. And uh, so last, last Jerry, I, I feel like we can't have a, a security talk without talking about zero trust. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> how do you think zero trust will play a part in the, uh, in future data protection strategies? Yeah, you know, um, I, I chuck a little bit because zero trust kind of has, it depends on how you you take the word, right? I was at a conference and um, we were using the word zero trust. And, uh, and, and, and then like, I think just before that, we were talking about you need to trust your employees, but not in the sense of trusting their access. It was just about like building trust and enablement for them to do the best job for the business. Um, and so somebody said, well, you were just telling me to trust our employees. Now you're telling me to trust nobody. <laughs> so it's just this idea, right? So what we need to do is, is look at zero trust in what it truly is, right? It's a data security model that aims to protect networks against all devices, all users, regardless of where access is sourced from. Uh, and that's the important aspect of what zero trust is trying to en en envision for an industry. We've got, we're all using all kinds of different devices, right? You just, and uh, apologize, you just heard my personal cell phone ring, right? So we're, I, I use my personal cell phone for work. We use corporate cell phones. We use personal laptops, corporate laptops. My, I have my iPad here next to me, which is my personal iPad. I can use any device to access my data. 
So the idea that I can just trust you simply because you're using a trusted device needs to kind of go away. That device is no longer the, the only device I use for business. And so we've got to kind of envelop security around the device now because we all use all kinds of different devices. Same thing as a user, I used to just be able to type in a username and password and I had access to everything I needed. Well, users get their identities compromised all day, every day. So therefore, I can no longer trust users and trust you are who you are. Uh, and the same thing from network access. I used to trust that if you're on my physical network, I should just trust you inherently. Well, that's no longer valid because my network can be circumvented or compromised. Somebody can get on the network and I no longer want to trust that access that's on the network. And so it, can, it just continues to go round and round that we have proven ourselves over and over and over that we just can no longer trust inherently any particular type of access from where it's coming from, for what kind of device and, and where it's going to. So the model assumes that any device and any user can be compromised at any time and their shore should never be trusted. And that's what's driving the future protection strategies for any organization. With that foundational model that I no longer trust any, any device, any user, any application, because we're all accessing different applications now, right? I go to, I go to Zoom, I go to YouTube, I go to uh, all these different, you know, Google Drive and Azure and everything else. If I can start to wrap security policy and start to understand the intent of the access, who you are as a user, what kind of device you are, okay, I'm going to make an adaptable policy. We've always had security that's been either allow or deny. And we can no longer live in that world, black and white world. We now live, need to live in the world of what are you trying to do? What are you trying to access? Where are you accessing it from? And what is the intent of your access? Like, are you trying to copy? Are you trying to edit? Are you trying to download? Are you trying to save? And when I can start to figure out all these different indicators, I can now start to create very, very intelligent policies that allows us to have the best user experience while having the best security without compromising performance. And that's what we're, I, we see the future going. And that's what Netscope is really concentrating. That's our vision and strategy is providing the best user experience without compromise. Uh, and it takes an ecosystem and a platform that is able to see all the different indicators using artificial intelligence and machine learning and taking kind of some natures of the human element out of it because we as humans are just too slow to make decisions. I've got to be able to put some AI capabilities into it so I can make the best decisions at the right time with the right level of security. And that's where the future is really kind of headed of is ensuring that we can deliver that zero trust security model with the right controls and delivering it at the right time to do, to provide the best user experience. That's awesome. And, and uh, what, what a way to end it. I, I, uh, Jerry, I appreciate your time and coming on the podcast to talk all about this. And, and really I'm, and I, I almost want to say the title of this podcast is security as a team sport because it's so important. And uh, thanks for your insights and talking about Netscope and what you provide there. Looking forward to chatting in the future as well about all things security and how, you know, as a CTO there, we can make the world a better place and safer place. Yeah. I appreciate it, Connor. Thank you.